both for, for being here. Um, all but two of you have to be here. Um, so, like I said, but um, I, I know that you're all very happy to be here. I certainly am very happy to be here to introduce His Excellency Benny Rodiono. Uh, he has, as I've told many of you on several occasions, uh, he has been a, a career UN diplomat, um, but also a professor um, and a scholar. So. He received his PhD in economics at Texas a and is that correct? No, the other one, the best one. Oh, Austin? Yes. Austin, oh, okay, so. <laughs> we have some Texas in here, Texans in here, so. Um, in 1963? 60, yeah, it's very, I'm very old. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, uh, and, and so his career is bookended uh, by academia because he now is a uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Connecticut Stanford. Um, I first got to know, may I refer to you as Benny? Yeah, sure. Okay. Because I, I can't, you know, so I, I first, I don't know when I first got to know Benny because I actually found a business card I received from you before the first time I recall meeting you. So I think we met at a conference somewhere, yeah. and you gave me your business card. Maybe the AAS. Maybe the AAS or maybe the ISA, but yeah. it was something that, it, it underscores, I think, the generosity that Benny has in nurturing scholarship, including my own. So I was a young nobody, and he was willing to come up to me at the panel and, uh, and, and uh, introduce himself. And, uh, and then I have since gotten to know Benny working together uh, CKS board, um, but also um, having read his book, uh, which um, is which you have all read for this class. Uh, this was something that uh, chronicles uh, Benny's experience experiences in Cambodia in the Untak period first, from 1991 to 1993, when he was the uh, provincial, so the UN appointed provincial governor of Siem Reap province, uh, and then back from 1994 to 1996, if I'm correct. Um, as UN ambassador to Cambodia. Uh, the book is one of my favorites about Cambodia, and I'm not, not just saying this because you're in the room, but also because it is, first of all, very, uh, it's, it's something that is not filled with jargon, it's something that's easy to read. It's also something that's compelling to read. Um, and it's also controversial in that there are some interpretations there that buck against the conventional wisdom. And that is, of course, something that scholars seek to be able to do. Um, it's, uh, and that book was written for two, uh, while well, uh, you were at Cornell for two years? Three years. Three years. So, in a sense, we're a room for Cornellians, you know, except for a couple Harvard folks. But, you know, for the most part, we're, uh, you know, and so, as, the last thing I will say is that uh, as I started to become interested in Cambodia, Benny was one of the, really the most generous people to kind of nurture my interest and deepen my interest. And I hope, I, I know that he will do the same uh, with all of you. I don't know what the ground rules are in terms of questions. Any time. Any time or any, any, any type? Or any time. But any type also? Time also, yes. Okay, just, just to know. Right? Except my age. Exactly, right, right. So uh, I've been told it's 45. But um, the thing, I guess this is kind of off the record, so that we can kind of ask if, if that's. And then, um, in any case, I don't want to take up any more time because it's far more valuable to hear what uh, 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 His Excellency Frederick Dillon has to say. So let me. It is my distinct delight and pleasure, and really honor, in this in this venue to introduce. His Excellency, Benny Mujiano. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I don't know where that Excellency comes from, but... Uh, well, uh, I first would like to welcome our President, Lois de Manu. It's a big honor for her to be like, li listening to one of the lectures, but she is the whole head of the whole CK, so she should know what we are all up to here. Uh, now, Lois and I have one thing in common. <coughs> we have a problem with our throat, so if I, if I talk, uh, you know, a little bit with the uh, accent, you know, please uh, forgive me. I also, so, yes, as uh, Andrew said, I am very much a Cornelian, three years, you know, uh, and I will prove it 
my credential like this. <laughs> <laughs> and my house was my house is on this side, Telluride House. Anybody has been yeah. to Telluride House? Yeah. How many of you? You have been? Yeah. What did you do? The Halloween party? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just visited. That's oh. fun. <laughs> so, so this is my credentials that I am at Cornell. <coughs> no, Andy said I had supposed to be two years there, and then it became three. And actually, Tuck, or, or another trustee, you know, is the head of the Southeast Asia program, Kehin Center. Maybe some of you know Kehin Center on Stewart Avenue. And he was in, uh, invited. At the, when I had a book launch, he was asked, uh, inviting everyone for a party. And uh, one guest came, you know, young man and younger man. And Tuck says, "Welcome to the Kehin Center and to the launching of Benny's book." I am Tuck. Tell him, I never know how his last name. And who are you? Oh, I'm Tim. So who are you, Tim? I'm, I, I'm the owner of Benny's other office. So Tom says, which one is that? Oh, that's the bar there, or next, <laughs> next to the Thai restaurant down there. <laughs> so Tom says, oh, this Benny, you know, he keeps asking for extension, extension, and he spent all his time in the car. But finally, my book was uh, published, as Andy says. So, Thank you. So, okay, so first uh, I will go, I'll start with the Rocky Roads to the Paris Agreement. Now, uh, uh, I heard that actually your lecture for this morning uh, was postponed until tomorrow, but I think from your readings you know very well what I mean by uh, it's, it's a rocky start when the Vietnamese, you know, uh, entered Cambodia in 1979, just a quick summary. Uh, the U.S., China, and ASEAN uh, were not happy because Vietnam, you know, is the one who liberated Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge. And in New York, the the three of them, you know, China, United States, uh, United States, and uh, and uh, ASEAN engineered the resolution which recognized the Khmer Rouge. Uh, as you probably, I'm sure, you know about this. Well, Deng Xiaoping and uh, what's his name? Uh, Jamie Carter have a newfound love and started uh, started uh, diplomatic relations. Now this went on for a long time, uh, and of course, in the meantime, they concocted two more what I call contra groups. If we use the Nicaraguan contra words, that is the Putin Pack and the uh, uh, KPNLF. So. So as you know, well, throughout the 1980s, uh, there are two governments. One, the CGDK, headed by Sihanouk, and one, the People's Republic of Cambodia, uh, since 85, headed by the man on the, on the right here, the little slim guy, you know, called Hun Sen. But be careful, now he is not so slim, but he is still there. <laughs> so this, these are two with a lot of staying power in Cambodia. In fact, maybe they are the ones that influence a lot. Now, this handshake here is a very important uh, meeting because don't forget that they, they were the enemies, actually. As, as I said, you know, because the CGDK headed by, by Sihanouk had the, all their troops, they I call them warrior refugees in the refugee camps you know, because they must have some kind of land. And Hun Sen, of course, has the People's Republic of Cambodia. So finally, in 1997, they decided to meet at Fer and Am near Paris. So this is a very historic moment in 1997. So because of this historic meeting, you know, uh, uh, the ball started rolling for a solution in Cambodia. Indonesia happens to play a big, big role, uh, an important role with the Jakarta informal meetings. Why is it so important? Because Indonesia has diplomatic relations with all, all of them, Vietnam and, and, and uh, of course, also uh, the, uh, and, and was uh, the chairman of the, of the ASEAN at that time. And these meetings are called cocktail parties because 
uh, in a cocktail party, you can ignore the other people. If you have a round table conference, everyone has to talk to each other. But they are called cocktail parties because the commanders never talk to each other. But they were all there. And this started the bomb rolling until we have the Paris Agreement. Now, Indonesia was represented by Alex Alatas, Ali Alatas, this fellow, and here is uh, Alexander Dumas from France. So the two of them convened the Paris Conference, which I'm sure you know, brought, finally brought an agreement to have peace in Cambodia. Now, this is what, what I call a very important. Uh, let me see where the bank got it off. Yes, so the Paris Agreement uh, were signed, but it has two flaws. You know, the, I, I call uh, the Paris Agreement UN's ostrich policy. You know, I, I, Kofi uh, Annan, the, the UN, did not like my, my book because as Andrew says, it has some controversial thing. And I think there were two, uh, two missions. First of all, the Khmer Rouge has turned into a peaceful dog. So after recognizing the Khmer Rouge since 1979 until 1991, they finally believed the Khmer Rouge is a nice boy. And this, of course, was disaster. The other uh, ostrich policy is, oh, Hun Sen doesn't exist. Because Hun Sen, the PRK the, the, uh, government was not recognized by the US, etc. And therefore, they said, uh, the, this Hunsen government does not exist. So these two myths will uh, create a lot of confusion afterwards and actually were, uh, uh, until today, it has some repercussions on Cambodia. The Paris Peace Agreement, uh, I entered the, uh, uh, created UNTAC. Well, everyone here in the room knows what. And uh, you're from Thompson TCCC? Yes. Yeah. Did you read my book? No. I did not read your book, but I no, have looked at your information. Okay, yeah. Well, UNTAC is uh, the United Nations Transitory Community in Cambodia. So, why was UNTAC created? Because the, uh, in order to, to, to uh, solve the problem of having two governments, uh, why not make the UN temporarily the governor, government of Cambodia? And so therefore, we were created, we means Munta, because as Andy said, I was part of Munta. However, the UN was not allowed to have a trust, uh, uh, authority as a trust uh, territory, uh, over a territory. So in order to solve that problem, they created the SNC. You know, you heard of, uh, you have read the thing. The Supreme National Council, which consists of the four factions. One is Hun Sen, has six seats. One is Sihanouk, has two seats. Khmer Rouge has two seats. And KPNLM has two seats. So, uh, so in, in essence, this was supposed to be the legal authority of Cambodia. Why? Because the UN, as I said, cannot assume sovereignty over a nation. So therefore, this SNC was the supreme authority in Cambodia, but then it delegates to UNTA all necessary authorities to govern. So I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm supposed to be the government, but I have to learn with fantasy and hope to delegate to the authority. Now, in the meantime, of course, uh, this fellow here on the right is laughing at all this UNTA business and SNC. That's Bullshit because uh, we are the government. You know, that's, that's why it's, this I call it the whole unholy trinity. So from the beginning we have a lot of confusion. Who is really in charge? And a mixed picture. Here is when UNTAC resolution was adopted in New York and the president and myself, Excellency, <laughs> Excellency Andrew and myself. <laughs> So this was 28 February that the resolution on UNTA was uh, was adopted. So what the, what's the delay? You know, the Paris Agreement was 23 October 1991, but in the UN, you know, you cannot just uh, overnight create an army. 
you see, they always have delays. And uh, because everyone has to vote, how much is the budget, and so on. So there was this, yes? I'm sorry, Ben, uh, I'm, uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, please. You've got a little very okay, Benny. Close. You click on the close. 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 Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> she was in the same way, by the way. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Yes, so there was this delay from the start. I hope you have to make a picture again. <laughs> it's always a delay in the UN. You have to create the army. You have to, first, you have to create the, the fifth committee, has to give the money, etc., etc. And that took four months uh, because uh, you cannot just suddenly spend. Kofi Annan once said that. The UN is like a fire brigade, and when there is a fire, they have to find the, the people who stop the fire. So you have to recruit all the people. And the UTAC mandate consists of ruling uh, of free and fair election, demobilization of the whole Cambodian army, control over four existing administrative structures, repatriation of 360,000 refugees, and human rights and economic rehabilitation. The holding of fair election was a big success and also the repatriation of refugees. These two were failures because of these two myths that I mentioned before. Now the last one, human rights was relatively success but uh, in a small way because it was not the priority of UNTA. Now when the world invaded to uh, Cambodia. It's, I call it the world because we have 15,547 troops and military observers, 3,500 civil police, 1,149 uh, and uh, civilian staff. I was, I was one of them, and UN volunteers from 100 countries. Estimated cost 1.6 billion. That for the UN is astronomous human. Uh, it's enormous. But today, of course, they spent that in one week in Afghanistan. The human aspect of Buddhism, you know, because all that you can read in the book. But, uh, high salary, mission subsistence allowance for all in international recruit position, 4,350 a month. That's where I paid off all my children's education there. And Buddhist staff, Earn 300 a month, uh, fabulous by comparison, as it got around, since my grand lady got $6 at that time, you know, because of inflation and so on, so yes, her salary was $6. So all the Cambodians, many of them get 300 oh, that's a fabulous salary. Most dedicated, most Cambodian UN volunteers and human rights officers. I mentioned earlier that the human rights was the uh, was a sort of an afterthought actually to the Paris Agreement because it, it was not uh, in this process of what I mentioned to bring reconciliation to the two parties. But it was a success because the people who are dedicated, who are uh, officers of human rights, I will show you later, are very dedicated people. Please, uh, Least uh, dedicated international secretaries based in New York who also got 4,350 because they are internationally recruited. Now, UNAMIC is the authority that was created because, as I said, when the Paris Agreement was, uh, uh, <coughs> was adopted, we must have something in Cambodia immediately because. Uh, and we, we have to wait in the, uh, the uh, 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 recruitment of the UN and so on, and the resolution was only adopted in, in February. And so there was a higher trust in power which was uh, covered by this UNAMIC, but un, un, insufficiently. So this is a uh, I didn't cover it so much in my book, but uh, you know, it's the 
small reconnaissance mission. October 16 is even before the Paris Agreement if we already adopted it. And to March and us to prepare the ground for Luna. Actually deployed 1,000 military personnel supported by international. The original was a very small group of military observers, but then we added 1,000 people who are doing demining. So, so, uh, so here comes this small UN people, you know, you know, with carrying UN flags, etc. But uh, on the ground, there is still hostility. So we have to assist in maintaining the sea ceasefire. But dynamic prolonged led to a serious deterioration of the situation and allowed serious fire, a ceasefire violation and other. Uh, because the, the people say, oh, here is the UN, you know, everything will be under control. But the UN was only 100 people somewhere, you know, and, <clears throat> and so all the violence continued. In fact, Q. Sampan, the head of the, of the Camaros, uh, was almost lynched. You know, and uh, uh, when he arrived in Phnom Penh. Now, here are these two again. Now, they are very wily characters, these two, but very clever. You know, Hun Sen, see, Hanuk once told the French ambassador, you know, this Hun Sen is, I wish he was my son, not the other one. Because he's, 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 he's shrewd like, like see, you know, the two of them. That I already showed you the handshake. Now, another thing is when November 14th is the triumphant return of Sihanouk to Cambodia. Now, remember this he was returning as the head of the SNC, Supreme National Council, and which has no power, as I said. Uh, it's just a combination of six people who don't, 12 people who don't talk to each other. And, and they know very well this to you. This SNC is, is, has no power. So, November 20, Hun Sen recognized Sihanou as the head of state and not just the SNC. This is a, this is a, they put the fast one there. They actually said, to hell with your Paris Agreement. The two of us, we can fix Cambodia, no commandos. And you will be the, the head of states like you were when you were ousted in the coup d'etat in 1970, and I will be your prime minister. So this was, of course, very, uh, very clever. Well, very shrewd, but uh, and therefore they would like to bypass the whole UNTA process, the whole UN process. November 20 and 23, signing of the SOC Pacific. Alliance, the whole maneuver, Paris and the Khmer uh, 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 As you know, at that time, Sihanouk was actually no longer the head of Putin Bank because he is, as the SNC is supposed to be above him. And Ranarit became the head of Putin Bank. Ranarit is his son. You know. and, but uh, of course, now this is a course on, on China. There's some guy in New York who was not very happy with this. Oh, oh, no, no, oh, no, no, because that's China. And it soon, soon was dissolved. Because China wants its protege, the Khmer uh, to be involved in the whole process. No good self with Sihanou uh, trying to bypass the Khmer Rouge. No, so th now this, actually, I, I'm, I'm not so clear. Well, maybe Andre can, can point out later. Because China actually has, has gone through this Potential big process of modernization and so on. But why are they so uh, still adamant to protect the Khmer Rouge in this process? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you that same question. My, my response would be that this provided China the perfect opportunity to no longer have to fund the Khmer Rouge, to no longer have to be associated with it. So that would be my thing. Okay, yes, yeah, okay, yeah. But, but they continue to insist, you know, that. This, what Hun Sen is doing with King Sihanouk is, is no good, you know. Uh, but, uh, so, so, well, because this is a course on China and Cambodia, you see. But they have, the Khmer Rouge has very, uh, very high, high up of friends there in New York. 
And also the U.S. was actually not well, wanting to abandon the Khmer Rouge. So the, as I said, uh, because of this myth, the, there are two failures of one time. Failure of demobilization, failure to control Cambodia civil administration. So let's look at it one by one. Number one, of course, is because of the myth that the Khmer Rouge has turned into a dove. Khmer Rouge has turned into a peaceful dove. So what is the military component supposed to do? Supervision of the ceasefire. This was done by military observers. These are military intelligence people, uh, you know, from from major countries. I had in my my uh, province of Sibri, we had the best intelligence officers were from France, for me, you know, because they know the country well. But we also had uh, American and uh, even the Russian also, and the Americans and the Russians were very close friends. Uh, but these are actually done by military observers to observe the system. Then, regroupment, internment, and demobilization of 70% of the Cambodian armies. This was done by those, all those different armies that I mentioned. Three, uh, so verification and withdrawal of all foreign forces because the commanders keep claiming that there are still Vietnamese forces in the country. And for my clearance. Now, the mobilization was proceeded very well. The game was to be completed in four weeks. The, of the three factions, except for the commanders, the other three factions were complying uh, with the demobilization. More than 55,000 troops of the three parties, except the commanders, has been disarmed. But this demobilization was aborted because of the Khmerus. But this is a, I, I was being the government of Syria, I was sitting on a podium with, together with the military commander, the Colonel, Colonel Kamal from Bangladesh. We have a battalion of military and we observed this demobilization. And I suddenly hear a chuckle from the military. You know. So I said, what is this internal joke you have? You know? Uh, you have to show me because they were saying, you know, the weapons they they brought to us for the mobilization was, you know, uh, actually museum pieces, as you can see. So they kept the good weapons. It's all a big farce. But so this you know, joking, you know, and the soldiers, Bangladeshi soldiers, accepted it, uh, all these museum pieces. So that was a farce already. But then the whole thing collapsed because the Camaros. Uh, refused to comply. Well, the Khmerus, this is me among the Khmerus, uh, but we had a good time because that's the good Khmerus there. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't forget, but you know how the Khmerus has been uh, 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 hosted since 1979 and this occurred in 1992. So they are supposed to be good. Then. But this picture is very interesting. Uh, on that occasion I was there, uh, I was uh, for the wine taster for Sihanu because Sihanu wanted to visit the, his, the Khmerus areas. As I'm sure you know by now, Sihanu and the Khmerus have, have a love-hate relationship. So he wanted to visit the Khmerus area and he was given a French helicopter for the very most, the most modern helicopter for six people. But I have to go there. I call myself a wine taster. They say if, if I'm there, you know, if I get killed, he get, if he get killed, I get killed too. So I was uh, going to the Camaros area. But they were very friendly. But for one thing, uh, when uh, Akashi and Sanderson, both of them uh, were the leaders of the uh, UNTA, I wanted to pass through Khmerus territory to go to the Thai border. One soldier in one arm, Mr. Bangu Paul says, no, you cannot go. Yeah. And he turned back. And that is the defining moment of Bhutan. It's like Bhutan is a paper tiger. How can you stop them? But uh, of course, uh, you don't want to get killed. And I, I was, uh, the wine taster had to stay overnight with the Khmerus. But some, some, uh, some uh, 
journalist from Thailand, you know, who were afraid for me, said, okay, we can take you back and come back tomorrow when there's a big celebration. So when I returned, typical Cameroon's version, you know, I said, they said, where are you going? You are our guest. And I said, oh, they want to take me to Bangkok. No, no, no. You go through territory, you will get killed. Many Vietnamese there will kill me. Of course, they will kill me, you know, but they call it Vietnam. Uh, so, the end of the thing, and then after that, Khmer Rouge uh, attack anywhere, anywhere they please. And you know, is, is there, is there, are they going to Chongkhnia, the missing village, or no? No, no. We're going to be around the thing, but no, not sufficient. Okay, yeah, the Chongkhnia is a big village in, uh, at the border of the town of Sa. You can go there in your free time by bus, you know, but uh, there's, there's a Vietnamese village. What happened is, uh, the Khmer Rouge, as I said, was part of the Untak machinery, the SNC. So when we discussed the electoral law uh, in the SNC, uh, Khmer Rouge says no Vietnamese can vote. So we, we, the UN, you know, we said, of course, if they are living here, they are Cambodians and they can vote. So we devised the law that if a parent is Vietnamese, one parent, then they can vote. And the grandfather, if one grandfather is also, they can vote. The Khmer Rouge did not, was not happy. Uh, with this arrangement, and the next day they attack this Chongkhnia village and just killed with you know machine guns, children, boys, and so on. About I forgot how many died. It's in my book somewhere. And uh, as a result of this Khmer Rouge attack, all the ethnic Vietnamese had to be evacuated because they don't want to to be killed by us. The UN evacuated to the Vietnam border, and they stayed there for years. So because of the Khmer Rouge, uh, they didn't get their way in the negotiating table, they just killed. And they got their will fulfilled. The Vietnamese in Cambodia could not vote. So that's why I said they are not a, not a turtle dove, you know, they are, they are like that. But when they couldn't get what they want on the table, they just killed some Vietnamese, you know, about 30 of them, and all of them left. And we, you and, you know, human rights, blah, blah, blah. We evacuated all the Vietnamese. Attack on Siem Reap was also another one. Uh, well, I was the governor of Siem Reap, and they attacked from all various uh, directions into the city. The hotel where you were in was occupied by the Khmer Rouge at that time. And I had the, uh, uh, the only telephone, long distance telephone, that can be used because the Khmer Rouge has destroyed all their long distance was in the Untak. Untak. Uh, so I called my wife in Stanford and I said, We are attacked and it's very dangerous. But uh, I survived, obviously. <laughs> so Khmer Rouge violated all provisions of the Paris Agreement. First, they argued that. So why do they why do they violate? Well, their reasoning is this: number one, the S and C had not uh, been. Well, okay, let me put this in. When we uh, when they agreed on the Paris Agreement, the Khmer Rouge wants Hun Sen's government to be completely dissolved and the S and C to be at the real power, not this Mickey Mouse power, which actually S and C is. Khmer Rouge is the only one uh, who carried SNC flags. When I was in in that uh, in that Spilin, the headquarters of Khmer Rouge, they all came with SNC flags, you know, greeting us and Akashi, welcome, welcome, SNC, you know. Uh, so they said they, we we have failed in our duty to have SNC actually uh, uh, replace the Hunsen government. So that's why they say. So you don't do you what you should do. I will not do. I will not do the, the, the demobilization and so on. You 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 don't value, you value the Paris Agreement. They say I also value the Paris. And second, they have the UNTA has failed to exercise its mandate to control civil administration. I 
we have in Khmer, uh, Siem Reap at that time two Khmerus uh, liaison officers, you know, generals, you know, and they every day they come to my. I mean, they can repeat, repeat, you know, typical communist way. Every day they come to me and say, when are you going to control Hun Sen's people? And they repeat the same thing over and over again. And so they say, you don't control Hun Sen, we are not going to cooperate with you. And certainly, we said, there are still Vietnamese forces, but of course, as I said, uh, they told me, you, know, you cannot go in there to Thailand, you will get killed by those Vietnamese. Well, there were no Vietnamese in Thailand. The Vietnamese are on the other side to begin with. The second base, the Vincent government does not exist. So, my task in Siem Reap as the governor of, of UNTA is was to exercise direct supervision and control of such administrative, blah, 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 election, especially in the ministries affecting foreign affairs, defense, and so on. <coughs> I was given a compliment of 10 people and Hun Sen's administration has hundreds of In theory, it was give considerable powers. In practice, uh, I mean, became one of the most challenging and controversial part of Hun I still remember, I have some very good staff. I have two ambassadors in my staff, ex-ambassador. One is uh, Simon Oguma, the ex-ambassador of Benin, he was very serious, you know. And he speaks French, of course, being from Benin. And, and uh, at that time, the CPP, many of them still speak French. So he cooperated with them and said, you know, we are, well, I must control your revenues from this same real uh, operation, you know, so how to do it. Well, give me a list. So, of course, they gave them, him, Uguma, you know, a list of all the revenues. As soon as Uguma left, according to my spies, my interpreter, they laughed and, ah, 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 he believed, ah, ah, ah. But, uh, you know, well, maybe in the second hour, I'll say that today they still uh, rent a lot of revenues from Cypriot, but that's a different